Now, apparently, these people that have this genetic uh, background are people that uh, have an overactive pancreas or a very sensitive pancreas. And when they eat uh, sugar products, their blood sugar uh, goes way up, and then they squirt out too much insulin. Down comes the blood sugar. In my family background, my um, grandfather was a diabetic, late-year diabetic, and so were her, his brothers and sisters. They were all diabetics. So because of that, I thought possibly I was maybe hypoglycemic. My aunt also is hypoglycemic. For many people, the first signs of trouble with sugar involve the varied symptoms of hypoglycemia. Uh, most of the physical symptoms I had were sweaty palms, shaking, insomnia, I'd be dizzy, I'd, uh, sometimes I was so dizzy I'd actually fall over, you know, it was uh, things like that. I had pains in my chest and my stomach, both. The pains in my chest really scared me. And then I'd be nauseated sometimes, and these, these so-called, you know, symptoms or attacks would happen all the time. And I didn't ever know when they were going to happen. I had a mother tell me that, uh, that she was trying to change the family's diet, but the husband wouldn't go along with it because he insisted on his seven-course dinner, which was a six-pack and a piece of pie. And, of course, when he ate and drank all this, he would pass out on the couch and be gone for four hours. And he was such a jerk when he was awake that they were happy to have him out of the way. But it was quite obvious to everybody that it was his hypoglycemia that made him a, a surly monster. The surliness of Dr. Smith's patient is due to the lack of glucose being delivered to the man's brain. The hypoglycemic patient himself can find no cause for his physical symptoms or his irritation, temper, and depression. But in most cases, when the patient stops eating sugary foods, many of the severe problems recede. The hypoglycemic of today is too often the diabetic of tomorrow. More than 10 million Americans are afflicted with diabetes. Although the acute and often fatal symptoms can be controlled with insulin therapy, the long-term complications of the disease reduce life expectancy by as much as one-third. Whereas the number of people who develop diabetes and die from it keeps going up in this country, the disease is rare or unknown in societies where people use little or no refined sugar. Diabetes is two times as likely to occur in people who are 20% or more overweight. Yet, despite this, at least 40 million Americans of all ages are obese. Americans are constantly on diets, and one of the really horrifying things is to the extent to which children now have an overweight uh, problem more and more. Obesity is one of the biggest health problems in this country, and it's very much related to heart disease and diabetes. And so the idea now is to cut down on the food that presents us only with calories and not with these micronutrients. And sugar is one of those components, and saturated fat is another one of those. Obesity is a primary risk factor leading to coronary heart disease, which is the major cause of death in the United States, accounting for over 700,000 lives per year. One in three men and one in six women can be expected to die of heart disease before the age of 60. Cardiovascular disease is now the principal cause of death. It's important that we understand it. Okay, we recently completed a study in which we investigated the effects of sucrose as compared to starch on the metabolic risk factors involved with heart disease and diabetes in a normal American population. What we found was that when the same subject was consuming the sucrose diet as compared to the starch diet, he had higher levels of the blood lipids like cholesterol, like triglycerides. He had higher levels of blood glucose, higher insulin, also a higher insulin response to a glucose load, and all of these we consider to be undesirable metabolic changes, which would increase this person's susceptibility to the degenerative diseases that we are concerned about, which are, which are essentially heart disease and diabetes. I remember looking at a study that was made by Dr. John Yudkin of uh, the incidence of heart disease in 15 countries. Uh, he found that uh, there wasn't good correlation with the amount of fat or saturated fat that was eaten. In fact, uh, there are in Africa people who eat, who live on meat and uh, have a great intake of uh, saturated fat and yet do not have heart disease at all. 
Instead, there's a very good correlation between the amount of heart disease, the incidence of heart disease, and the amount of sugar that is ingested. Although very few studies have been done insofar as, as children are concerned per se, it goes without saying that they are subject to the same environmental stress as our adults, and the diseases that we are worried about are degenerative diseases that have a long incubatory period, that are with us a long time before the clinical symptoms become apparent. Children who are brought up in that way, and especially who continue eating sugar in these large amounts, will be up in the 160 pound per year range or higher. Some people are up to 365 pounds, a pound of sugar a day. And that the life expectancy will be correspondingly short. And not only is the life expectancy short, but to the incidence of disease at earlier ages will also be high. Children eat two, three, and even four times their weight in sugar every year. Teachers report that many American school children have a learning disability, a syndrome that includes short attention span, wild erratic behavior, emotional instability, and poor memory. Could the ingestion of sugar be involved in the bewildering behavior exhibited by these children? And these kids are restless and shaking and jumping up and down and ah, it's this franticness that uh, seems to get them away. They're motor driven and we can almost always relate it to something they've eaten the previous few minutes or hour or two. And the teachers can spot it, especially on the day after Thanksgiving or Halloween or special treats or parties. They can see almost, uh, you know, 60 or 70 or 80 percent of the classroom are in trouble. They can see the obvious change after this, uh, this particular sucrose ingestion. Teachers often tell us that the effect of these foods on kids is that when they arrive at school after having a highly sugared breakfast, they're hyperactive, they're unable to concentrate. They calm down, they go into a short period, maybe a half an hour to an hour when they're able to learn, and then they, they experience a complete energy drain because they've had empty calories and they've had calories that they burn up too fast. But they're all hooked on sugared breakfasts. The day-to-day -day existence that the, the teacher has to go through with this these four or five kids in every class, the kids that's crawling under the desk, and the teacher has to hold his, you know, by his ears and look him right in the eye and say, I'm talking to you, Charlie, and he's, mm -hmm, he's just not there. And so now we're getting teachers to be smart enough to ask the children each day when they come in the classroom, what did you eat for breakfast? And the child, if he doesn't know, it's quite obvious that his blood sugar is down and his brain is gone, and he's just, you know, it's just a spinal cord talking. And if a teacher finds that a child did not eat the proper breakfast, she should have the right to send the kid home. Many of the learning disorders suffered by children, as well as many emotional disturbances experienced by adults, are now believed to be caused by nutritional deficiencies. The brain, even more than other parts of the body, is affected by what you eat. I have found out in my research that the, the brain is the busiest organ of the body. A fourth of the blood supply goes right to the brain, and there's no storage for energy in the brain. So it has to have the right amount of water, oxygen, sugar, amino acids, and all the other components that uh, service the brain flowing through it at any one time. And if one of those supplies slips, like the blood sugar drops, then the brain doesn't work. And the cortex of the brain is the part on the top that does most of the work for us. There are academic skills up here. There's the Ten Commandments. Here's a place, be nice to your mother, and here's one, be nice to your wife or your children. All that is the human part of the brain. Academic skills are up there, cognitive skills, your perceptions of the world. Down below is our limbic system. It's part of the thalamus and the hypothalamus, our animal brain. Sex uh, drives, there's eating, there's sleeping and whatnot. Here's just as a reference point, here's an eyeball and here's a nose and whatnot. Now, the point is that this top part of the brain, the cortex up here, has to be completely and properly nourished all the time or human functions don't work. It goes to sleep. It's just not working because there's no nutrition. So when this goes, then we start to operate down on our animal brain. And when this brain is operating, why then anything can happen. You, a person can be a criminal, they can be depressed, they can go to sleep, they can act in strange ways, they can have disperceptions because the brain is not working properly. So when a teacher is confronted with a child in her classroom who didn't eat a proper breakfast, she's just talking to a spinal cord or a gorilla. By the time they come home from school, their blood sugar is dropping and they're evil and they kick open the front door like stars.